Okay, so um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so the starting point for my research is that uh, people are by nature monochronic. And that means that people, most people, like to start on a task, work on it through to completion before switching to something else. That's the way I am. That's the way most people are. But we live in a world in our digital age where we are forced to be polychronic. And that's because people have multiple windows open, multiple screens, people use multiple devices, lots of different applications, access to you know innumerable numbers of people and types of information. And so you know we have this polychronic lifestyle and uh, and yet it's contrary to what our nature is. So I'm very interested in how this kind of polychronic lifestyle leads us to do multitasking. So when people think of multitasking, they think of people doing two things at the same time. And that's not humanly possible unless it doesn't require a lot of cognitive effort like chewing gum and walking. But if you really want to do two uh, kinds of activities that require some kind of cognitive processing, it's not possible. Multitasking is really about switching activities very rapidly, interleaving of activities. It's, it's like time sharing with computers. So um, there's a lot of work that has looked at the effects of doing what's called media multitasking. And this is a little bit different than switching back and forth between different apps and different sources of information. But you know, th this work has especially looked at young people, teenagers, uh, college students, and they find that if kids are you know, doing their homework and uh, you know, doing instant messaging or doing their home homework and watching YouTube, uh, they tend to do worse on these tasks. Um, especially these kinds of tasks that require some kind of goal-directed, uh, uh, sustained um, attention. Um, also, um, these uh, people have difficulty from filtering um, inference from uh, stimuli that's in their periphery in the environment. And so this leads us to ask the question, has media multitasking led us to a very different way of processing information in this digital age? Now, um, there are challenges with measuring multitasking. And traditionally, people have used pencil and paper to measure it. And they ask people, you know, how much have you multitasked? How much have you used different devices? But you know, there are some studies that show that pe people are just notoriously bad at estimating time. And people can err up to about 30% right, Be being off with their estimates. And you can bring people into a lab, and there's lots of studies that have looked at multitasking in the laboratory, but these don't really reflect real world behavior, especially if you're thinking about the workplace. So you know, you, it, how can you model career trajectories or stress or conflicts with your uh, colleagues? So my perspective, and, and this, is, this is the approach that I take, when, when I do research, is that to really study people, you have to go where people are. And so rather than people bring people into a laboratory and you know, set up, you're creating an abstract model of the world, which has its advantages because you can control variables. But you go to where people are, and you create living laboratories. And that means that you study people in their natural environments. And you try to do it as unobtrusively as possible. So that's, that's the approach I take to, um, in my research. And it enables me to ask questions uh, related to multitasking, things like how fragmented is our attention when we work with digital media? And how do you explain distraction with digital media? And uh, how, does, how does using digital media affect our mood? Okay. So um, I've been asked, well, haven't people always multitask? What, what is new about this? So, you know, I, I dug into the literature. And um, 
First of all, no one has ever examined people's use of digital media, at least to the level of detail that we have, where we, we look at what people do to the second. But what people have done is they've, they've followed people around in the workplace, and they've looked at how people distribute their time over the workday. So we have some basis for comparison. So if you look at the, the two columns on the right, so this was a study done by Hudson and colleagues. This was done at IBM in 2002, a study I did with my student Victor Gonzalez in 2006. And um, these were studies when personal computing and email use were in widespread use in the workplace. And these other studies uh, were not. So we have some, some kind of point of comparison. And if you look at these two rows, the amount of time, the proportion of time that people spent doing desk work versus the proportion of time that people spent in formal face-to-face -face scheduled meetings, you see a difference there. And this Horn and Lupton study is a bit of an anomaly. So if you kind of you know, put less weight on that study, what kind of trends do you see? Right? You see some trends? So there's two things going on. The first is the proportion of time that people spent at their desk nearly doubled, right, with the, with the widespread use of personal computing and email. But also, people spend a much less proportion of their time in these formally scheduled face-to-face -face meetings. And if you put these two together, right, we can infer that a lot of the work that was formally done in face-to-face -face meetings is probably now being done at the desktop through email, through desktop conferencing, through instant messaging, through a lot of other channels. So my interest in going to where people are and studying what people do in their real world environments um, is uh, actually, it, it comes at a fortuitous time because we're, we're living at this time where there's this revolution in the development of sensor technologies. And so I want to talk about two projects that involved using a variety of different sensors to understand people's behavior as they work with digital media. Um, the first project is the Health Sense project where we've been tracking information workers. So we've, we've tracked over 100 workers to date uh, over multiple days, about two weeks. Uh, with a variety of different sensors. Uh, the second project I will spend less time on, but I'll just say a few words, and that's the Millennial Project. And that was looking at college students, where we tracked 124 college students uh, you know, in their normal college life, and we tracked them for seven days. Now, the grand challenge of doing this kind of work is that you know, if, you, if you were to do ethnographic work, Right, you get a good sense of the how and the why of what people are doing. Right, you can take a, a deep dive into context, and you can understand the context. When you're using sensors, you're getting different bits of information, disparate bits, and you have to somehow combine these bits of information. Now, it's pretty easy to measure stress because we have devices, wearables that can. Uh, measure things like heart rate variability, and, and you can understand stress. But how can you understand a very broad construct like workplace performance or organizational citizenship through sensor information? And at the very, very end, I'm going to talk about a project I'm working on to, to try to get at that. But I, I see that as being the grand challenge. So I'm going to present results of, uh, of a uh, number of studies that we've done. Uh, but I want to go through the measures with you so that you get a sense of how we collected the data. So uh, we measure stress uh, through heart rate monitors. We, we also now use our wrist wearables. Uh, you measure what's called heart rate variability. We've also measured. Uh, electrodermal activity using affectiva Q sensors. The newer version is called Empatica. Uh, we measure mood and people's focus through experience sampling. I'll talk about that a little bit later. 
Uh, we measure face-to-face -face interaction using sense cams. That's this, this picture right here. It's, it's a very small, lightweight camera, and it takes continual photos about every 15, 20 seconds, and then you apply software face detection on it to determine is there a face present or not. So you can infer, at least, if someone was uh, near another person. And it has very high accuracy in face detection. We, of course, measure digital activity by logging computers and uh, phones. Uh, we do activity tracking. We have people wear actographs, uh, Fitbits, or wearables. We, and we use those also to measure sleep. Uh, and sleep rhythms, and then we give people a whole lot of different demographic and personality measures that we use to correlate with our sensor data. <clears throat> so I want to start off by telling you what we can learn about people uh, through very simple information that we can collect. If we just look at temporal features of computer and phone use, just temporal features, what do I mean by that? I mean the time you turn your device on or off, what's the average length of time, uh, the dispersion, did you use it in a concentrated period of time or over the day, um, how often you checked social media, uh, the rhythms of use, is it more regular usage or irregular usage, time of day. So you put all these features into a model and we find that we can predict uh, the big five personality traits with a fair amount of accuracy, significantly better than chance, just simply in terms of temporal activity in using devices. So let's talk about fragmented attention when people are using digital media. So, we can start off by just, if we just log people's uh, computer activity, we see, and, and I should mention that there's a lot of data cleaning that goes into it, huge amount of data cleaning that, uh, so that we can you know, filter out all the noise, and, and that's just a, a huge endeavor. But just looking at the median length of time that people's attention is on any computer screen before switching to something else in the workplace. We find it to be about 40 seconds. And that's, uh, that's day in and day out, right? And that's a, that's a very short period of time. So, you know, I, I looked at this uh, number and thought that uh, you know, may, maybe there are individual differences, right? Not everybody has short attention duration. Some people spend longer, some people spend shorter. And so we dug into the literature and we hypothesized, we, we found that these are possible reasons that might explain uh, individual differences. So neuroticism, so people, People who score high in neuroticism have a lot of thoughts that are just kind of flowing through your mind, and this can interrupt your train of thought, and this could potentially affect your duration of focus. Uh, people who are impulsive, right? There's different dimensions of impulsiveness. Urgency is this idea. You just have to do something. You can't hold yourself back. Another dimension is this, this inability to just persevere at something. We hypothesize that people who were stressed would have shorter attention duration, and people who had poor sleep the night before because you don't have the cognitive resources you need to focus. And we also hypothesized the, the other uh, way around that if you, the longer your focus duration on the computer, the higher should be your self-assessed productivity at the end of the day. And we did find that, indeed, neuroticism and uh, impulsiveness urgency were significantly correlated, very strong trends with stress and sleep, and a significant uh, relationship with productivity. We did a factor analysis. And we find that these three variables clustered under a factor that we label lack of control. 
And so the way we interpret this individual difference is that people who lack the ability to control their actions, these are the people that have shorter attention duration when working on a computer. So I'm going to try to unpack this a little bit more. But first, I want to say that, you know, you, you say, gee, 40 seconds on the computer. Well, maybe that's not so bad if you're working on the same project, right? Probably everyone here is an academic. And when you're writing a paper, because we're in the business of writing papers, You'll look on the internet, you'll type in a Word document, you'll go on email, you talk to colleagues, but it's all the same project. So, so what that your attention is short on any kind of one of these micro activities? So this is actually from earlier work that involves ethnography where a student of mine followed people around with a timer and tracked every person's action to the second with a timer and took notes about context and found two things. First of all, people work in an average of about 12 different projects. And we call these working spheres, sphere of work, which is a little bit broader than the notion of project because it could be personal uh, projects as well. But clustering all these different micro, what we call micro actions into their respective projects, we find that people spend about 10 and a half minutes on any project before making a significant shift to something else. And for information workers, that's not a very long time, right? Because it takes, I mean, at least I know if I try to do something, it takes me probably 10 minutes just to try to get started to go into depth if I'm reading an article or writing something, and then I'm switching to something else. So let me talk about how people's rhythms of attention is distributed throughout the day. So the notion of attention focus, right? This has been covered by different kinds of constructs. So people have called, used this notion of cognitive absorption, uh, cognitive engagement, mindfulness. How many of you here practice mindfulness? Anybody? OK, some people do. Uh, or the idea of flow. How many of you know what flow is? OK, this is, um, uh, oh my god, it's going to blank. Sheiks and Mahali's notion of flow, where you're so immersed in an activity that you become completely unaware of the passage of time. OK, so all of these concepts have to do with attention focus. And then the flip side of attention focus, the way it's been treated in the literature is boredom. And so we know that uh, attention focus consistently is associated with positive affect. People are happy when they're focused. And we know that boredom is associated with negative affect, right? When people are bored, they generally tend to not be in a good mood. So if we look at this dimension of attention, and let's, let's think of it as engagement, you know, being really engaged in something or not being engaged at all in something. This is typically the way the uh, research studies have always treated attention. But we thought that perhaps there's an orthogonal dimension that goes through attention, which has to do with the idea of challenge. And this comes from the idea of flow. Because to be in a state of flow, it involves using your skill, but also being challenged at doing something, right? Without this notion of challenge, you can't be fully engaged. So we came up with this theoretical framework. And, and let me walk through it with you. So it's the idea that if people are really engaged in doing something and really challenged, we label it focus. Right? It's just a label that, that we're using. If people are really engaged in doing something and they're not very challenged, we call this rote, as in rote work. And let me give you an example, playing solitaire. Right? You're really engaged in playing solitaire, but you're not really challenged by it. Or, or a kind of mindless video game right? where you're just kind of 
really engaged in it, and it does involve any challenge at all. If people are not challenged and not engaged, we call that being bored. And if people are highly engaged and, uh, sorry, high, highly challenged and not engaged, we call that frustrated. Again, these are just labels. An example of frustration could be a, a software developer who has to figure out a bug and they're just not really into it, right? But it's, it's challenging. So people were given uh, these probes throughout the day. These are experience sampling probes. And they appeared on people's computer screen. And we asked them to rate how they feel right now. Uh, this top part of the screen is Russell's circumplex model of mood, where we're getting a, a measure of people's mood at this point in time. And then down here, then it asked, did you just have a face-to-face -face interaction? And then down here, we asked people, how engaged were you and how challenged were you in the thing you were just doing? We trained people on this beforehand, and they were able to answer this probe in about maybe two seconds or so, two or three seconds. Um, people were given these probes uh, about 18 times a day. Uh, the irony does not escape me that we interrupted people 18 times a day, but we got terrific data. So. Remember that attention is associated with positive affect. OK, so we find that people are actually happiest when they're doing rote work, this kind of mechanical, mindless kind of work. That's what makes people happy right? in, in the workplace. People are uh, less happy when they're focused. And then consistent with all the, the research, people are least happy when they're bored. Yeah. So you interrupted people, you know, every 45 minutes or something like this. Is that, given that you said that people switch kind of areas they're working on every 10 minutes, does that make it harder to get the data about what's going on at each of those, or do these kind of affect potential states kind of stay consistently for a long period? The, this. Um, so we actually had this kind of hybrid heuristics that we're using to introduce these probes. So we were particularly interested in capturing mood and attention, like right after Facebook use and right after email. And so we, we tr no, no, no. It's context dependent. That's right. That's right. And then when people unlock their screen, uh, we, we would ask them, and then if they had an interaction, we, we would know about that interaction. And when they submitted these uh, probes, we would get timestamps so we could sync that up with all of our other data so that we could try and make sense of it. But that, thank you for the question. So this is what uh, the rhythm of people's attention focus and different attentional states look like over the course of the day over our participants. And um, there's a few things about this that I find interesting. First of all, people's peak focus is about 11 o'clock in the morning, late morning and about 3 PM. So it's not like your focus is continual throughout the day. Um, being bored is somewhat of a, a uh, uniform distribution, uh, sort of. Um, but what I find interesting is that people don't come to work ramped up and ready to go, but it takes some time to ease into the work, right? To, to get into their work, right? They're, they don't hit the ground running when they come to the workplace. Yeah. Study who are the workers, what kind of situation? So these are information workers in a high tech company located in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> yes. Another question. When do these workers tend to arrive at work? So when are they right up from? Right. That's a great question. We put a lot of thought into that and we kept going back and forth. Should we kind of normalize depending on when people came? And then we decided that because there's because interaction is an important component of the workplace, we would actually do this according to the actual time. 
So if someone, you know, a few people came to work at seven. Um, but, you know, most people were in the workplace nine-ish or so, right? But we, we kept going back and forth. Should we normalize it as to the first, you know, and call it first, second, third hour? But, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. But we thought maybe it's better also because most people do tend to eat lunch at the same time. So we thought it would be better maybe to sync up by that way. Maybe one follow-up on this would be to ask, if you stratify and you're like, okay, let's look at people get in at 9, 10, 11 or something, do you see the same ramp-up curve? Or because everyone else is there, do the people who come in oh, later ramp up faster? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. That, uh, we, we have not looked at that, but that's super interesting to look at. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about work that was done with Alex Williams, who was a, an intern at MSR. And um, Alex was very interested in seeing if he could devise a way to get people to reattach uh, faster to work in the morning and to detach from work at the end of the day. And there's just a, a lot of work that shows how if people don't detach from the workplace, it creates stress and bad mood and, you know, it, it affects people's health and, and well-being. And so he designed SwitchBot, which was a chatbot, uh, that had, there were actually two conditions. So people used SwitchBot. Uh, first of all, they, they worked as they normally did and um, had their computer activity logged. Uh, and people w we were asked, uh, we gave them surveys, um, two kinds of uh, chatbot designs. The first asked was task-centric and asked people in the morning, what do you want to work on today? And the emotion-centric approach, a different set of subjects between subjects design, was how do you want to feel today? So get people to either focus on the task or focusing on the emotion. And at the end of the day, for detachment, the task-centric chatbot asked people, what did you work on today? Again, work-centric. Work and emotion-centric, how did you feel about work today? Right? It's like having your therapist at, at the end of the day. So we, there were 34 people um, over two work weeks. And I mean, the results were uh, interesting in that um, the reattachment chatbot, irrespective of whether it was task or emotion centric, re it received a positive evaluation. Um, but people with the task centric dialogue actually used more productivity apps in the first hour of the day. Productivity apps are things like Word or Excel or uh, Visual Basic Studio or anything that's related to that's work. Software company. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but it was not sustained, right? We, the effect was, was short-lived. It was only in the first hour. So I, I think that was informative. Um, the detachment part of the chatbot eh, got a sort of a meh evaluation. Um, but people in the evening actually did send significantly fewer emails. Um, and there was no difference in whether it was the task or emotion-centric um, uh, dialogue. And over, overall, people, they assess their productivity at the end of the day, and they assess their productivity um, higher. But there's, there's a lot, I think it's an interesting first step, but there's a lot more things that, that can be um, studied with respect to detachment and retachment. Okay. So now let's talk about distractions. Okay. So I've been looking at interruptions for a long time. And one of probably one of the most surprising things I found is that uh, people tend to self-interrupt or what we call internal interruptions almost as much as they get externally interrupted by some observable source, right? External interruption is a, a Facebook notification or a colleague comes into your office or the phone rings. You can point to some external stimulus that causes the interruption. An internal or self-interruption 
is, is really interesting to watch. You're, you're, as the observer, you're watching someone, they're typing in a Word document, and they suddenly stop and they check email or they stop and pick up the phone, right? There's no observable or explainable reason, uh, reason for the observer for this behavior. Now, we looked at our data and we divided the data into um, hourly time windows. And we looked at the relationship of external and internal interruptions in each of these hour-long time windows. And we found something really interesting, that when external interruptions waned, what happened was that internal interruptions started to kick in, right? And it's as though, I mean, the way I interpret this is that if your people are conditioned to interrupt. And if you're not getting interrupted by some external source, you interrupt yourself. Because people are just conditioned to have short attention spans. And they're going to they're going to cut off what they're doing, change their activity one way or the other, if not from an external source, then from an internal source. So that's my my interpretation of the data. Now, people have studied interruptions, and there's this assumption that people in the workplace, they work really hard, and they're really focused, and then along comes a distraction, like a Facebook notification. They go to Facebook, and then they get really bored. But we wondered if maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's possible that people first get bored or they get into a particular attentional state that makes them susceptible to a distraction, that makes it easier for them to be distracted. So we looked at uh, some common time types of interruptions based, based on our data. It turns out that 40% of interruptions are from some form of workplace communication. Uh, email, which is primarily work-related, at least in this particular company. Face-to-face uh, -face could be either. It could be work-related or social. Uh, and Facebook is primarily social interaction. And to give you kind of an overview of how people spend their time in these workplace uh, communications, we see that um, with Facebook, people average about 21 times a day that they check Facebook, email about 74 times a day. Actually, the high person in our sample was something like 435 times a day checking email. Uh, but they spend, they tend to spend relatively short periods of time. So people check Facebook, but they only spend about 18 seconds and then go back to work. And email, they um, average about uh, 32 seconds and then go back to work. So frequent checks and very short periods of time. So this is the way that we looked at our data. So we had this experience sampling probe. We had the timestamp. We had how people assessed their attention in terms of engagement and challenge. And we looked at the duration of time that people spent in Facebook, face-to-face, -face, and email. Face-to-face, uh, -face, by the way, were um, we, we, this is based on the, the SenseCam uh, data. Uh, we looked at various windows of time, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and they were consistent. So uh, I'm just reporting the 10-minute uh, uh, results. And of course, we had to control what people were doing prior to the probe, right? So here's what we found. We found that when people were in a focused state of mind, they worked significantly longer on email. When people were either bored or doing rote work, we found significantly more face-to-face -face interactions. And when people were doing rote work, we found significantly longer Facebook use. So there seems to be a relationship uh, between people's attentional state and what they're, they're doing after. Uh, so it took me six years 
to find a field site that was willing to let itself be cut off from email for a period of a week. Uh, and the, actually, the way I got that field site is, is a really funny story that I'm happy to tell sometime, maybe over beers. Uh, but finally got the, the uh, field site, and uh, we had people wearing heart rate monitors to measure heart rate variability, stress. We logged their computer activity. We measured them for one baseline week, and then they cut off uh, email for a period of the week. And we hypothesized that their stress would go down. Yeah. No. When that was going to occur, like yes. so that changed the behavior in the baseline week. Like, oh, I got to get this stuff done. And oh, it's going to be cut off next week. Yes, yes, they they knew, and it could have changed it. Uh, we 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 don't know how much it changed. Um, but after I show you the results, I'll say a little bit more about that. So when people were cut off from email, they did uh, focus significantly longer on any computer screen uh, compared to um, when yes, compared to the baseline when uh, when they had email. Uh, the flip side of looking at the data, it's sort of like the other side of the coin, is the number of switches per hour. And people switched about half as frequently when, when they didn't have email. And that didn't necessarily have to be the case. I mean, you might think, well, of course, they took away email. They won't switch as much. They could have switched as much with all of their other applications they were using, right? But they didn't. Yeah? Is this an organization where email was primary, or did they have things like Slack or other things? They didn't were... have Slack, so that they only had email. Yeah, and they, they were information workers, and it was an organization on the East Coast, not the Pacific Northwest. Uh, stress was significantly lower. You're, you're looking at this number and saying, wait a minute, but this is a higher number. And that's because heart rate variability, uh, the higher the variability, the more relaxed people are. And that's because if you're really relaxed, the least little Stimulus is going to make you jump and affect the variability. And if you're really stressed, the variability of your heart rate, the, cons the time between consecutive heartbeats, it's very regular, right? You're in this kind of fight or flight uh, syndrome. And so we found people were more uh, relaxed, when uh, less stressed when they didn't have email. Now, to James, to your question, we actually expect it that when email was first cut off, people would become more stressed, right? And then we would see a decline. But it was all over the map. So there, there was no particular regularity in people's um, behavior. So if people were affected by the cutoff, you know, it's, we, we can't say. But we, we can say that we did see this, uh, for some people, we, we saw this abrupt change when it happened. Almost the opposite, whether like you would see more stress and more email switching, like in the days before the switchover. Oh, like, I, I got to do this stuff because you know I'm not gonna have email next week. I better. Oh, I got that important email from Michael. I better take care of it, right? Right. Would it well, be like a, a a fact, like you're about to go on a trip. You know, you got to right. get all this stuff done. Right. So. Um, First of all, there, there was a significant difference between baseline and uh, cutting off email. So if the stress went up, there, there was still a significant difference. Um, people were allowed to contact other people, but they just couldn't use the email. And that was another interesting thing, was that people could have just walked down the hall to talk to someone in person, but they just didn't. For, for many of those cases, they didn't. Um, some people did. Um, one person, this is really interesting, um, he reported that his manager would always give him these little tasks to do. And he couldn't get any work done because he'd get an email from his manager that he had to respond to because it was his manager. When the email was cut off, his manager could have simply walked in and delegated face to face these tasks. But he didn't. He just stopped. So there was, the, you know, that's an interesting case of email being used to, to delegate work. So um, we asked, yes? 
measure if there was some sustained effect in the next week? Unfortunately, we didn't, right? And that's something that I wish we, we would have done. Right, so we did interview everybody, but we, I, I wish we, we would have. And you know what I suspect, what my best guess is, that there would be no change. That's what I think. Uh, so we asked the question, how does, um, what's the difference between social interaction that's online and offline? Offline meaning face to face. What makes people happier in the workplace? Right? It's an important question because mood in the, positive mood in the workplace is associated with motivation and quality of work and productivity. So by uh, online activity, we looked at Facebook because at this particular organization, Facebook was the primary online uh, social interaction tool that people used. And we looked at two different time perspectives. And the first perspective is comparing people's mood, positive affect, at the time the interaction occurred. Now, how many of you think that people were happier right after doing a face-to-face -face interaction compared to Facebook? How many of you think happier after face-to-face? -face? How many of you think people were happier after doing a Facebook interaction? Nobody. How many think there was no difference? Uh, the answer is face-to-face, -face. so people were happier. The second time perspective we looked at is people's happiness at the end of the day. We asked them to reflect back over the day and, you know, how, how happy are you, you know, you're leaving at the end of the day. This is important because there are carryover effects of workplace mood to personal life at home. Now, how many of you think people were happiest at the end of the day, the more face-to-face -face interaction that they had during the day. Okay? How many of you think they were happier the more time they spent on Facebook that day? How many of you think there was no difference? How many of you don't know? Okay. Fair, fair enough. Uh, so it turns out that the answer is Facebook that the more time on Facebook, the happier people were at the end of the day. Now, this was puzzling for us, so we went back and dug into the data, and here's what we found. We found that there was this very strong correlation between using Facebook on that day and reporting that they were engaged in their work. And so here's the way that um, we interpret it that if you're really engaged in work, you know, Facebook offers you this way to move in and out, to take a break under your control. You can move in and out, right, seamlessly under your control. The last thing you want to do if you're engaged in your work is to have a face-to-face -face interaction because you are a prisoner of that interaction, right? You're working really hard on something, and you have to do this face-to-face -face interaction. There's a greeting ritual and the interaction and the parting ritual, and you can't gracefully just leave. So we think that um, Facebook offers this, what we call grazing behavior when people are really engaged in work. So we wanted to see what would happen if we blocked distractions. And there's a lot of commercial software out there that people can use um, to block distractions, and, but it had not been empirically tested. So we decided to do that. We did a field study. We had um, 32 information workers. We used a commercial uh, software called Freedom, uh, measured five days of baseline and five days when they had their online distractions blocked. People could choose what it was that distracted them and what they wanted to block. And this is just a rough approximation of what was blocked. Most of it was social media, but they also blocked news sites, uh, eBay shopping sites, and so on. So using uh, the cognitive absorption scale, which is a, a well-validated scale of attention focus, we find that with this blocking software in use for a week, people's focused immersion in an activity significantly increased. 
Uh, temporal dissociation means you're so immersed in something, you're unaware of time passing. That actually decreased. That means people became more aware of time. Uh, there was no difference in their feeling of control, which really surprised us. Uh, their enjoyment decreased while we took away their social media. And uh, there was no difference in curiosity. So we interviewed people afterwards. And the reason that they reported why focus increased, first of all, uh, we removed attention residue. So when you take care, when you look at Facebook or do an email and you come back to your work role, you still have this residue from that interruption, right? This, this kind of part of your attention is still focused on that interruption. And that was removed. But we also stopped chains of distraction. People reported, you don't just check Facebook or check a new site on the internet, but you go into this rabbit hole of distractions. And we took that away. So then we looked at the data to try to figure out, well, why didn't we see a difference in control? And it turns out that from the interview data, there were indeed two different groups that emerged, people who had high self-control and people who had low self-control. And when we looked at, we had measured uh, the big five personality traits. And we found that people who, uh, through the interviews, came off of, as having high self-control scored significantly higher in conscientiousness and um, significantly lower in this impulsivity trait of lack of perseverance. So we had some, some validation from the interview data. And then we looked more into the data. And using the NASA TLX scale, which is a measure of mental workload, which includes the uh, measures of stress and mental effort, we find that people in low self-control you know, there was really no significant difference in their mental, in their workload when they used this blocking software. But strangely enough, people who were in the high self-control control group had significantly higher workload when we took away their online distractions. And so, you know, in going back into the interview data to try to explain it, it seems that, you know, these are conscientious people. And they don't take breaks. They just worked straight through, right? They could have taken physical breaks and gone to the coffee room, and they didn't. They just stayed there. They didn't have their online distractions to, you know, to take a, a quick mental break under which they would have control and were able to get back to work, right? One person missed her shuttle at the end of the day, which had never done before because she was just working straight through. Um, there are opportunities for improving work experience from this uh, data. First of all, thinking how to balance rote and focused work. If we know that rote work is associated with people being happy, we have to think about how we can balance that throughout the day. Uh, and also scheduling work based on attention patterns. I mean, we showed you this just this overall view, but there are personalized patterns of attention that could be looked at. There are times when people can be very focused and other times not. We can uh, design interventions to increase focus, reduce stress, and improve mood. And I have a project working on that now. And uh, we can uh, block distractions for people who are have low control. Right. So it's important to consider uh, individual differences. So I was going to talk about the millennial generation, and I'm running out of time. But I will just present one result here, and that has to do with sleep. <laughs> because college students are notoriously uh, bad with sleep. Uh, and so what we did was we looked at, you know, there's a lot of studies that look at the effect of using technology on people's sleep that evening. And we asked the reverse question. How does people's sleep uh, quality the night before affect what they do with digital media the next day? right? And here's what we found. We looked at sleep debt. We figured it doesn't make much sense to just look at a single night of poor sleep, because habits are hard to change. But what happens when poor sleep 
accumulates over days, right? Then you accumulate sleep debt, right? You get more and more tired. And we found a significant relationship that the more sleep debt that people had accumulated, the more time they spent on Facebook the next day. And that's easy to explain because Facebook is lightweight, does not involve cognitive resources, right? So it's something easy to do if you just lack these, these mental resources. What's the DB in this regression? Uh, the the uh, like Facebook. 4.17 watts <coughs> coefficient here. So it was Facebook duration, I think it was seconds. So per switch, they're spending four seconds longer on Facebook, something like that, ish. Let me let me look. Okay, at sorry. Yeah. You. Sorry that I um I think it was seconds. I think, I think, but let let me. What's the get back to you. where did the paper show up? And it's at Kai, twenty sixteen. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'll check but it. let let me get back to you because um, sleep debt was not measured in terms of seconds. Right. So, like, what's the Yeah, it's. I'm trying to think about, like, in, you know, in sort of an ipsitized sense, like, if I'm one standard deviation sleepier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but let me. Yeah, of course. I have to look that up. Sorry. Um, Oh, well, that's good. But I, I will look it up because um, you caught me and I can't remember what. Um, but I, I, I mean, I remember the, um, that, this okay. This is what you say, read my paper. <laughs> <laughs> Type my paper. So, <laughs> so um, now I'm going to put on my psychologist hat, which, um, which I, I really like to do. And, um, you know, how do you explain all this? And so th this is the idea, this is what I think about. Um, you know, there's a long history in psychology that it's very consistent and talks about how people strive to maintain a, a kind of inner balance, right? This kind of balanced emotional uh, and psychological state. Um, Hippocrates talked about with, with the body, harmonious balance. Gestalt theorists talked about the law of pregnance, where you have this unified uh, theory of perception. Uh, my favorite psychological theory of all time is Kurt Lewin's field theory, which is that our ultimate goal is to reduce tension in our lives. And every action we do is designed to reduce our tension. And of course, you, you know cognitive dissonance theory. And so, you know, this is an idea that I work with that maybe people adjust their use of digital media in order to achieve an internal balance when, when they're working at it. So, you know, when things become too stressful, perhaps they switch to, to something else to try to balance this out. Uh, very quickly, I want to talk about what I'm currently working on. Uh, the test rate project, very excited about this. It's, it's the same idea of using sensors to predict a workplace experience and to, in particular, organizational citizenship, organizational deviance, task performance, um, stress to the point that it gets to burnout. Um, and our target is to measure 750 workers over a year. Uh, to date, we have about 250 people enrolled. Uh, but I hope we'll get close, if not achieve 750. Um, and we have a, a lot of different sensors that we're using, you know, wearable devices, um, beacons, so that we can look at a location, phone agent to see how people are using their phone. And we're also looking at people's uh, social media use. And I do want to stress uh, we are very concerned about privacy uh, of our participants. And you can look at the URL for more uh, information. Uh, this was, work was done uh, with the collaboration of a number of really incredible people that I really need to, to give them credit for this work. And I would like to thank our sponsors, but also our participants. Thank you.
questions. Yes. For the purpose of reducing uh, internal interruptions, I'm wondering if you thought about like interventions, like like um, people fidget spinners or like give them like background music, etc. Like, like, can you like can you like kind of combat the need for internal disruption um, before they decide to even like go to the Have you thought about that? So, uh, so to all right. So if we think of an internal interruption as mind wandering to think of some way to kind of prevent that mind wandering. So we haven't done that, right? That, that's a, I would say that's a grand challenge. That's, that's going to be really hard to do, but uh, it would be really great if someone were able to achieve that. Because it, that, it's really, it's hard to measure mind wandering. Um, but if there is a way that you can, you know, find a way to um, get people to focus and prevent it. That's that's the million dollar question. I think you had previously mentioned to me the idea of when you think they're going to have to do some internal interruption, intercede with some other less bad internal interruption. So you're still oh. doing something, but you know it's not quite as disruptive. Yeah, that's interesting. So more closer related to the context of your work. So my question is, what about the difference between volitional and non-volitional interventions? Like, can we intervene without people even realizing that they are being intervened? Should we do it? Because it seems like part of the challenge here is this, like, you know, engagement, but there's yeah. also a challenge of, like, you know, developing a new habit. So maybe we need yeah. to develop interventions that might not even, like, depend on your will to do it, but maybe just force you. Like nudging. Yeah. Nudging. Like, maybe just, like, allow you to change your breathing by changing some kind of, like, maybe your temperature in the room such that you start bringing out different pains. Something like that, that you don't even realize, you just keep working. Yeah, I, I think there's just a lot of room in this area for, um, for experimentation, but, um, but I, I really love that direction. Yeah. Yeah. A final question, please. Yeah, just, you mentioned that people feel better when they do sort of rote work. I'm just curious about the increase in automation and concerns about that how we can keep people, I guess, engaged at work and happy, but still, I guess, not you know, totally replaced by, by software machines. Right. So there, there does need to be some uh, in, intellectual type of work. You can't just have people doing this kind of mindless work. I, th I think it would be really interesting to think about uh, what the right scheduling is, right? The, the road work can offer a kind of respite, right? Focus uh, is also associated with stress, we found. So you can't, I mean, it, you don't want people to just focus continually throughout the day, but you really want to have some kind of balance, right? Automation might move the balance right to the other way where people are just doing this kind of rote work. On the other hand, you know, people are arguing that automation will free people up to do the intellectual work, right? And let the machines do the rote work. And, and maybe this is what you were getting at, that you know, would people be less happy if we're taking the rote work away? I don't know. That's a good topic for a study. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Oh. She'll be here for a few more minutes.